uh, students, uh, uh, I take pleasure in uh, introducing uh, Arpita Ghosh. She is a manager bioinformatics at Eurofins Genomics India Private Limited, a company uh, who is involved in uh, genome sequencing, transcriptome, or you name any uh, omics uh, uh, service. Uh, they are ready to offer uh, their service to you. And uh, she is uh, associated with this company for the last three or three and a half years. Uh, prior to uh, taking this job as a manager bioinformatics, she was involved in another company that is Acceleris uh, Labs, that is in Ahmedabad, again as a bioinformatician. So that only uh, uh, speaks about her rich experience in the field of uh, genomics, in particular the genome assembly. And she is a trained bioinformatician. I think she did masters in bioinformatics. Yes. And uh, later on, she took degree for uh, business management as well. So the combination of bioinformatics and business management made her uh, business manager or manager in bioinformatics at Eurofins. Okay. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Arpita Ghosh to deliver her talk on genome assembly, and I'm sure this lecture will. Uh, uh, in the sense enlighten you, uh, rather update you uh, over and above what you learned in the last seven days. And she will be talking uh, in length about the strategies for assembling genomes. I think last year I requested her uh, to give a special focus on microbial genomes and she did a wonderful uh, job of delivering a lecture here, well appreciated by many. And that only prompted us to invite her once again for addressing the student trainees here. And uh, I thank Arpita for accepting our invitation. And I'm sure you are going to enjoy her lecture. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah. I can stand here itself. <coughs> thank you. Is the mic on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for a wonderful introduction. Uh, I am a trained bioinformatician and I will talk about the basics how we go for a genome assembly or what we should consider when we are going for a genome assembly. So, uh, the basics of uh, plant pathology is that uh, we have bacteria, viruses, fungus, everything infects plant. What is the common thing is the genome assembly. Genome sequencing of any of these organisms can get you into many details about these organisms and how you can understand the plant and the host, uh, the host pathogen interaction you can understand. So, these applications of genome assembly is very important. Genome assembly is just a technique how we do it, but how we interpret and get to the depth of science that is what is important in understanding and to interpret and get to a result. The main applications of plant pathogens are we can identify the pest which is infecting. For example, I have more than one organism infecting which is non-culturable bacteria. If it is non-culturable, I cannot identify with the traditional techniques. right? So, we also have DNA, we can isolate the DNA from that particular sample and identify which bacterial species, whether it is a non-culturable, if we do not know which bacteria it is, still we can come to a conclusion that this is getting infected with a non-culturable bacteria, which is cannot be cultured. So, we can do a DNA sequencing and identify that, right. So, if it is more than one also, we can do metagenome and identify. So, that is what is the strength of NGS there, right. NGS can do all this. Sanger sequencing which we have taken classes in different sessions, Sanger sequencing cannot do when you have more than one species, but NGS can do it and identify that which organism it is. If not which organism, it would at least let you know that it is a non-culturable bacteria. That is what is the strength. So, these are major applications wherein this plays a role to identify the plant pathogens. We also have, yeah, so in this case in NGS we do not have to know the pathogen or we do not have to know the gene which we are working on. If we do not know, we can go for a de novo, right. So de novo means I do not have a reference at all and I do a sequencing of it, 
for example, fusarium. Now many of them are sequenced, right? But still, if I have a new strain coming up and I know it is different, as we know the pathogens, each and every genome is very diverse and very different from each other. So, to go for a new strain, I can do a NGS. I cannot do a Sanger sequencing or anything. Sanger sequencing is when I am doing a small stretch and for that also if I have a genome that is beneficial, then only I can compare, align and identify the SNPs and all. But in this NGS, if I do not have a reference, if I do not know a genome also, I can do this. So, for example, there are new pathogens which are infecting your plant. So, I can do a sequencing from here and I can identify at least a close related species or I can identify that fine this is a non culturable one which is getting infected which is having an infection right. So, this is what is the strength of NGS and the genome sequencing. Now, come down to the NGS processes. The basic outline of NGS processes is that we isolate DNA. When we are going for a genome sequencing, we always start with S, uh, isolating the genomic DNA. I think so you had a session with isolating genomic DNA. The same process is followed. After that we do a QC for the DNA, that also I think so you have covered. Then we have library preparation. Library preparation is nothing but ligating adapters. These are components of the library kit. For example, if you are doing a sequencing on Illumina, we have Nextera kit, we have many other kits which are available for preparing a library, right. So, these kits have been used in which we have components like adapters, which these adapters are very important components which binds to your DNA template. How will your machine identify what is your DNA template? What has to be sequenced? So, these Illumina adapters which are there, we will go in detail how they bind and all. So, those adapters attached to these DNA templates and the machine can identify that this DNA templates needs to be sequenced with the help of those adapters. Those adapters are nothing but a primer set, similar to a primer set which has a copy in the machine as well. So, it binds and then the DNA templates get sequenced, right. So, that is how the DNA template is getting sequenced. So, that is what is called as library preparation. So, when the library is prepared, the DNA templates are attached, we do a QC. Why we do a QC? We want to see what is the length of my DNA template, right? Is my library proper size or it is out of size? If I have, for example, I am sequencing 2 into 150 and if I have a library size of 1000, I will have a huge gap between two ends, right? We have a paired end sequencing. Paired end means I am sequencing from forward and I am sequencing also from reverse, the DNA template. So, when I am doing that, if I have a 1000, I only have 150 and 150, it is a huge gap in between and this gap is very important, we will see how it is important for assembly, right. So, for that we do a library QC and we know that the library of a paired and, li uh, paired and library should be somewhere around 300 to 400 base pair this should be my library size having an adapter of 120 basis. So, we minus it. So, we should have a DNA template somewhere around 250 to 200 yes or else 250 to 350 wherein I have a very small insert size in it right. Then we do a sequencing and how the sequencing looks we will see we get two pairs of reads that is R1 and R2 right that is forward and reverse in case of pair then. So, we will see how the sequences also look yeah. <laughs> 2 into 150 is uh, we have two sets of reads of 150, 150 basis right we will talk about it in detail. So, how it works and what is 150 and 2 it is a read length right. So, reads are the sequences, the DNA template is sequenced 150 basis two times from the forward and from the reverse. In Sanger also we have a forward read and we have a reverse read. Similarly, in this also we have a forward read and a reverse read in case of paired end. So, there are different different libraries with different different direction of reads and these different directions make it very important for us for assembly. 
right, the gaps, filling and all. We will talk about it. So, I think so that will be getting clear. So, the library profile looks like this, wherein this is where the library is. So, in this case, I have a library of approximately 814. This is a mate pair library, in which I, it is a bigger library with a longer insert in it, right, long insert. So, if I have longer gaps in my assembly, if I have repetitive region in my assembly, this type of reads can resolve it, because it has a gap between it. So, what happens in the assembly? It will consider this 814 minus 120, because 120 is my adapter straightforward. So, that goes off. 814 minus 120, that becomes my sequence insert length in between the two sequence. So, when an assembler works, it will have an overlapping of this first R1 pair and will find that much distance in between and find the other pair there, right. That is how the accuracy works. So, the both the reads will move in that particular distance. So, plus and minus standard deviation will be provided to the assembler. So, accordingly it will move. So, it is not a random matching of reads, it is a accurately, accurately matching of reads like this, moves like this, right. We will see how it is. And now in paired in, because it has a smaller distance between two reads, somewhere around 400, 495, minus 120, that is what my library is. So, you can see the library size is small. So, this is how we check the library QC on a tape station or on an Agilent bioanalyzer. This is the library which I was talking about paired in and mate pair. Now, if I am talking about paired in, as I said, it is one read is your uh, forward read and another is your reverse read. How it is generated? These are your adapters, Illumina adapters you also have a barcode in it. Barcodes are nothing but barcode or indices you can call. These are nothing but in a sequencing run, in a particular NGS sequencing run, not only one sequence code, there are many other sequences. To segregate one sample to the other, we have a 8 basis adapter, right, which is called as indices or barcodes. These 8 bases segregate each sample wise sequences hope you are following me. So, these small 8 basis sequences for that particular sample will be exactly identical. Based on these 8 bases, software segregate the data sample wise. Yeah. So, we know after sequencing when we get, we get a whole fast Q file. From there, we segregate sample wise based on these small 8 basis indices. These are called Illumina indices. So, the Illumina indices is there, after that we have the sequencing adapter and then I have the DNA template. Now, Illumina sequencing chemistry is a bridge amplification. What is the bridge amplification? In my flow cell, I will have a one complementary pair of the adapter. Now, this will attach and it forms a bridge. This is how. So, this is getting attached, this will go here and attach. The non-template will wash away and the other template will amplify and the amplification is in thousands and that amplification happens and then we have a read. So, this is your forward read and this is your reverse read. This is how the reads are generated, right. So, there are two P5 and P7 adapters based on that the forward read and the reverse read is getting generated, yeah. So, this is how paired and chemistry works. Now, for mate pair, we have a circular region, how we make it a bigger distance between. So, we have a longer distance in mate pair to resolve the repetitive regions and to resolve the ambiguity in the genome. So, if I have long gaps in the genome, if I have long repetitive regions in the genome, we use these type of libraries in which it is a circular library, right. This is also sequenced and it also has a different thing, it is a circular library and it has a junction sequence. This junction sequence is very important, it is a 38 base pair sequence which identifies the direction of the read. The sequencing chemistry is same as this, 
but the direction is just opposite it is reverse and forward got my point the sequencing is reverse and forward so when it is reverse and forward the distance between the two reads is huge the distance between the two reads will be like this this will be roughly the distance you can see the barcodes are getting attached here that is your indices this is what is the difference distance so in my mate pair i have a distance somewhere around 300 350 for my sorry paired and i have a distance of 300 350 400 base pair but in my mate pair i have a distance of 1 kb 2 kb 5 kb 8 kb so that distance is this part and the direction of the read becomes reverse forward so this is very important for a genome assembly and how the genome assemblies are like how can you improve your genome assembly based on these type of libraries it is very important to understand what type of library can be used for what type of uh, genomes like if you have repetitive genomes you have to go for more of mate pair if you have normal smaller genomes you can go for paired end. so you have to understand what how and how these libraries work in the reality in genome assemblies so now I will talk about the different insert size which I talked about the distance between the two reads that is your insert size. So we have paired in which is your forward reverse. So the distance is in these small very small. So they align like this if I have a distance more this is 1 kb or 5 kb or 3 kb this is green color is my R1 this is R2 we will see how R1 and R2 looks. So what happens is that when I have a longer repeat this distance between these two reads will help me find an overlap right when I find an overlap this part will be filled with ends right but the smaller distance ones can resolve these ends with having an overlap with these parts at my point. So this is the way we resolve the gaps between the genomes or we resolve an ambiguity between the genomes. We also have smaller chunks if you have seen in NCBI we have cantig, scaffolds, chromosomal level these are different levels of genomes which we find in NCBI. What are those first we go for cantigs then we go for scaffolds how we go for cantigs and scaffolds we will see and this is the part behind the behind part of creating a cantig and from cantig to scaffold if I want to go I need a library like this wherein it will have a overlap of one or will be having a partial overlap but these reads will fill up my ends. So this is how different insert, re insert sizes work in a genome assembly. So if I have different insert sizes different chemistry I can work out and resolve my gaps in the genomes right. So we have many chemistries with different different read lengths. We have only talked about Illumina chemistry at present. I will go in brief on the other chemistries as well. So we spoke about paired end and mate pair of Illumina. So in Illumina we have three different instruments that is HiSeq, MySeq, NexSeq. We also have HiSeq X series which has come but the chemistry is same as HiSeq 4000. So we can generate read length of these. So these are read length. When I talk about read length what I mean is this, this particular read will be 150, this particular read will be 150 that is why it is 1 and 2 that is why 2 into 150 right. So that is what is the calculation of 2 into 150. So 2 into 150 it can also generate 2 into 100, my seek is longer read length that particular run fetches you lesser amount of data but gives you a longer read length. So if I have longer read length also I can resolve gaps right how so if I have uh, instead of 250 if I have here 300 if I have 300 I can even better resolve my gaps right. So this is how 2 into 300 now next 6 500 is again an Illumina platform which can generate 2 into 150 these are instrument outputs so high seek is a huge data output with a somewhere around 1500 GB in one run it has 7 plus lanes and gives you 1500 GB in one run 
So, just imagine if I am sequencing a pathogen, I will just require 4, 5, max 10 GB, how many samples will go in this particular run? So, that small basis of 8 stretch will segregate those samples. So, can accommodate so many samples together. Now, in MySeq, we have only 15 GB of output, but gives me a longer read length. NextSeq, again 120 GB. Now, comes the longer read length. In longer read length, we have at present PacBio and Oxford Nanopore. Nanopore is upcoming, so it has a maximum read length of 900 KB. Earlier, what used to happen is these shorter, these shorter sequencing chemistry, when we are doing a contig, we get a size in KBs, right? One contig or two contigs will be in the KBs, right? In this, we get the sequencing itself in KBs. Just imagine the sequencing, if it is that big, the assembly becomes even more easier, right? We can resolve many more gaps. But these chemistries have very high rate of error. Why? Because they are introducing indels or introduces errors. So, errors means SNPs, indels. So, we cannot segregate from our original things, it will introduce itself. So, what is recommended is that if you are going for a higher genomes, clubs shorter read length plus longer ones. What will happen? The error rate which is there in this part will get resolved with this chemistry. Each chemistry has its drawback, each chemistry has its yeah, advantages. So, advantages and drawbacks if you want to combine it together and you want to get a good result, we usually combine the different libraries and different platforms that is known as hybrid. So, we do a hybrid assembly. So, this hybrid assembly helps us overcome the drawback of the other platforms. So, in this we have maximum 15 kb and gives us a data of 5 gb within one SMRT cell, right. So, we have small small SMRT cells in that PacBio is getting sequenced and in that we get 5 gb in one particular SMRT. In, nano, in this Oxford Nanopore, we have up to 5 GB data of 900 KB, but usually we only end up with 3 to 4 because it is just coming up. We also have a new uh, chemistry coming up in this uh, uh, mini ion, new chemistry has come up which has improved in sense with the error rate, but the error rate is somewhere around 10 percent. That is a huge number, whereas the error rates in these are 0 0.08 percent only. So, that what is the difference in the error rate of these chemistries, right. So, we combine these chemistries together for doing a sequencing. We also have a platform called ion uh, proton or ion S5, which is a thermo based platform, which also gives you around 15 GB in one run, goes up to 200 base pair. But this is mainly uh, for very small genomes. So, if you are doing uh, bacteria or something and if you have the setup, you can go for these platform as well. But main players in the market are Illumina and PacBio. Yeah. So, when we are uh, calculating, for example, if I want to go for a genome of 50 MB, right. How do we go for a genome? We consider a coverage. I do not sequence 50 MB, 50 MB only. What we do? We sequence 50 into 100. That is one particular region of the genome, I want it to be sequenced 100 times. When we talk about coverages, if we have read genomic papers, we have a world called sequencing coverage. We have sequenced it at so and so coverage. If I say 100, the sequencing is done at 100 x coverage that means I am sequencing a particular region 100 times, right. So, this 50 into 100 becomes my 5 GB, right. So, if it is 5 GB that means 5 GB data I am generating for the genome of 50 MB and if it is like 100 times theoretically I am sequencing one particular DNA template. Right. It will not be identical. If it is identical, it is PCR artificates and it will be thrown out. 
So, it will not be identical, but that particular region of the DNA will be sequenced 100 times. That what is the theoretical meaning of coverage. So, that is how we calculate how a genome has to be sequenced and that is when you can just imagine how many samples will go in particular run. If I am only generating 5 GB, this is what is the run output of particular platforms. Right? So, once we have done the sequencing and we have the data, the data looks like this. So, we have one R1 which I said as forward read and we have one R2 which is a reverse read in case of paired N. So, how we identify whether it is R1 or R2? It is usually written in the file name of the machine generated file, but still if you have misnamed, we can identify using this. This is one and the same thing is here and this is the header of the read. This header of the read will have your instrument ID followed by with the flow cell. So, when we are doing a sequencing, we have a flow cell which is barcoded and universally in Illumina product that will only be unique. Right? So, using that barcode, the sequence has this. Right? For example, as run goes fails off, the Illumina can detect which flow cell it is which lot number it is and whether that particular lot has gone off. right? So, that is the way you can trace your flow cell and followed by the tile number. So, each flow cell has its tiling. You have an <coughs> image system to capture the sequencing. The clusters which are formed with bridge amplification with the intensity they capture the color. So, where which tiling it is, which position all this information is written in the header and the important part is this 2 and this, this 1 and this is 2. The entire header will be same for these 2 sequences, only difference will be 1 and 2 and this is how a software, any assembler will identify this is my forward read or this is my reverse read based on which library you are using. Second thing is that the barcode which is written the 6 base pair barcode is written here, ah. right. So, this you can see it is identical for all because I have taken only from <coughs> one file. So, a sample will have identical barcodes and you can see the R2 also having the same barcodes, right. So, based on this we can segregate the sample wise samples from a run. So, if you have 10 samples in one run, I can segregate 10 files 10 into 2 because R1 and R2 based on these barcodes and this is my header line, this is my sequence ATGC sequence, this is the strand and this is my quality of that ATGC. At what confidence is this base called is this quality, this is an ASCII quality of it. This is how a fastq file looks and this is what is the raw data which comes out from a NGS machine. Yeah. The Ma'am, they are basis uh, quality ASCII score. So, if you convert it capital A will be 65 something like that. So, ASCII score it is. So, you see the conversion in ASCII. So, you can convert it. They are all uh, values. Then once we have done a sequencing, we do a QC of the reads. How do we do the QC? We do the QC based on this and this. This is my quality. So, I do not want any poor quality reads to be there. How we can identify that? Based on these graphs. So, if I have dropping quality to 2, which will be an average quality. So, I do not want. If I have a read like this, I filter it out, I remove the low quality reads, I remove the reads which are having too many ends, more than 5 percent ends. That means that read could not identify that particular base. If it is not able to identify that particular base, it will throw off as ends. So, I do not want such reads which already has ambiguity, which will not help me in my assembly. So, we will remove those reads, we will trim off the initial reads. If you see the initial reads, they might have low quality, right. So, we trim off the initial reads 
based on the quality. If my average quality is not more than QV30 or QV25, I trim off those reads. Right? QV35 is a standard <coughs> quality uh, reads. So, we trim off those reads which are not in a, on average 30, QV30. So, we trim off these reads. We see overall coverage of average coverage of this. If it is coming below 30, we will remove those reads. If we do that, this particular read looks like this. So, now my average goes up to somewhere around 25 <coughs> and my uh, median is somewhere around more than 30. Right? So, such type of reads we go for analysis. These type of reads which machine throws we do not because this can also happen because of the library preparation, it might happen because of the sample uh, condition, the DNA is not properly isolated or the DNA was not of good quality. Many reasons can happen for such type of reads and we filter it out and we get such reads. Once we get such reads, we go for de novo assembly or reference based assembly. We have two types of assembly, wherein if we have a genome already published, I already have a reference, then I can straight away go and sequence this read and map it on the genome. That is known as reference base reference base reference and on that basis I am calling my genome right. If I do not have a reference at all I go for de novo assembly. De novo assembly wherein I do not have any reference I am going to assemble using some assembler right. So, we will see how it has been done. In layman language de novo assembly looks like this. If I have a cut papers, it will look like this and I need to assemble it like this. This is what is de novo, wherein I have no clue based on only overlaps, I am going to get to the genome. So, this is how we do a de novo <coughs> assembly. There are lot many steps for uh, validating the genome assembly and get to a proper draft assembly. So, the raw reads we already saw, we that fast Q reads which we have R1 and R2, these are my raw reads. Then we quality filter, which we see that the quality, the quality should not be low, ends should not be there in the reads. So, we quality filter the reads and then we go for a primary assembly. Uh, assemblies are again of various types, we will see how they are being done. And we usually use paired and in mate pair in the assembly and we can also do a hybrid assembly using PacBio or any long read sequencing like Nanopore. So, if we are using PacBio, we have a different filtration step because PacBio reads are longer and they have different sorts of uh, insertion deletions. Now, SQL platform, it filters the data and gives you using smart SMRT analyzer which is already there in the system. So, it filters the reads based on the quality and gives you. So, all the bases which are there in the pack by read will be of same quality, right. So, you do not have to filter it based on quality. Now, what we do? We use the short reads and map it on the pack bio data using softwares and correct the reads of pack bio. The reads which are having more number of indels or reads which are having more number of insertion, we see any ambiguity, we remove the read from my data and then we take all those data together and do a hybrid assembly. Yeah. In hybrid assembly again we have several stages, first is contig, if I am only using paired in data I will first do a contig then I go for scaffolds, contigs are those which are small stretches of sequences which does not have ends in between, major chunks of ends, scaffolds are those which connects those contexts together with stretches of ends in it, right. So, we go for contexts and then we go for scaffolds. After the scaffolds, we have lots of stretches of ends. So, we do a gap filling. The gap filling is where the longer insert length comes in play and longer read length comes in play. So, we use the mate pair, we use the pack bio for my gap filling, right. Once I am done with the gap filling, we have a draft genome which is ready for validation. I have a draft genome with gap filled with contigs, 
super scaffolds and gap filled <coughs> genome. So, this is what makes it a draft genome. Once I have the draft genome, what we check is the whether for example, I am assembling a 50 MB genome, I should get an assembly nearby 50 MB, I should not get a assembly of 1 MB in that. If I am getting a sequence genome of 1 MB, something is very much wrong in it. So, I should get something close to 50 MB with a lesser number of contents, lesser number of scaffolds. The lesser it is, it will be more towards the original chromosomal level, right. Usually, we will get in thousands, right. The more lesser it is, more accurate it becomes. So, that is where we validate the genome and then we can do several analysis like functional annotation, comparative analysis, we can go for structural analysis and all. That is like how we can identify the genes from the genome, we can compare it with other existing genomes, several analysis we can do, but this is the base to, to get to the genome. So, as I said that in this assembly we have several steps, we have several algorithms with which we can assemble the genome. One of the algorithms is overlap layout consensus that is OLC. So, many of the softwares work on this basis overlap, how it works? It works based on overlaps. If anybody remembers the graph theory nodes and edges, so nodes and edges these are all mathematical algorithms. So, behind the software this what works, but on uh, when we are using it we do not actually go to this depth, we are just explaining how it has been done. So, for example, we use uh, overlapping that is just the sequence matching has been compared. So, anywhere it gets an overlap of certain basis that has been specified when we are doing an overlapping base algorithm, we specify I want 100 basis to be overlap, I want 50 basis to be overlap, I want 5 basis to be overlap. Based on my requirement, I will tell that this much base overlap I require. So, what it does is that this is the way it will find the overlaps between the sequences. If I have raw reads, the raw reads will be getting an overlap like this. So, what happens is nodes are my reads and edges are my overlaps. So, just imagine the mathematical uh, uh, network of nodes and edges, one line here, the circle here, again one circle, one line. So, this network is getting created in millions of reads. Just imagine the computational power required for doing millions of sequencing. When we talk about 5 GB, it is some millions of sequences, right. So, we have overlaps, each and every sequence gets finds an overlap with that first sequence and that overlap is getting built up and just imagine the capacity which is required to find these overlaps and once this overlap is found, we have a consensus sequence this is how a context is formed. This is one of the methods. The another method is de Brunjan graph. Most of your assemblers will be working on this algorithm. In this we, uh, the raw read is been assigned a k-mer length. K-mer is nothing but a small sequence length. For example, if I say k-mer, k-mer are usually in odd numbers, right, cannot be an even number will always be in odd numbers 27, uh, 29, 35 something like that yeah cannot be even. So, if I say 27 my 150 basis which I am talking about 2 into 150 that 150 basis is chopped in 20, uh, 27 right. The entire just imagine millions of reads 10 million reads getting chopped in 27. So, many reads fractions get created. So, these are the small fraction of reads which are getting created. Now, in this <coughs> one sequence will be finding its overlap against the other sequence. Each and every sequence will get matched to the each and every sequence of other. Just imagine how many. So, this way the de Brunjan graph is created and based on this the overlap of sequences gets attached to each other and when that happens it creates a contig, right. So, it, this is how contigs are created using several softwares. 
such as uh, we will see what are the softwares. Soap de novo is one, CLC is one. <coughs> These are different softwares. We also have a list, so you can see the list. So this is a, just a, a presentation how we create contact. So this is a DNA template. We have a forward and reverse reads. This is what I was talking about. The distance between the two reads is called as insert. You can see the red part. This is what is the insert between the sequence. And these are the million reads, how they go and assemble with each other and they create a contig. Once the contig is created, they create scaffolds. How they create a scaffold is in this way. What happens is the, I hope I am not blocking you. Yeah. What happens is the insert, the longer inserts which are known as mate pair or the paired and reads as well. The longer inserts which are there will cover up and attach the contigs into scaffolds. So what happens if I have a gap here? I will have several reads here also, right? If I have several reads here, I can cover up this particular gap. But where did I get the clue of this region that how do I know this contig is after this contig? How do I know that? No, I do not have an overlap. I have an insert information, right? I have an insert information. So based on this, I can identify this sequence is after this because the read of my R1 and read of R2 is going to the other contig. So I know this is against this, but what is there in between, I do not know. That <coughs> in between part will be the overlaps. The in between part to cover this, I need an overlap, but to know this is after this, my insert sequence will be telling me. Yeah, will be sequence, but you can find n still no, because repeats are there. There are many complex regions which cannot be sequenced with sequences, right? So you have repeat regions, you have uh, other things like uh, ambiguous regions. Mm. Yeah, it will create problem and it will skip those regions, will not sequence those regions. So that region to capture those regions, these insert sites helps us. Insert sites will help us or else long sequencing will help us. So if my long sequencing reads, one maps here, gets a significant mapping here, gets a significant overlap here, then I can say exactly this is what is the sequence here and this can connect these two contexts together. Right? This is how we connect the entire genome and get to a scaffold level of the genome. So this is how a context looks wherein the ends are not there and they are shorter in, shorter in the sequence. Whereas scaffolds are longer having ends that is we can combine these two together using ends. This information comes from my insert sequence and based on overlaps I can resolve these ends. This is the basics of assembly, how it has been done. Now based on uh, assembly after what we do is that we have ends in between, we do a gap filling. How do we do a gap filling? In gap filling, we have uh, two sets of uh, gaps. One is physical gap, which is no information known about the adjacent context. We do not know what is there next. So those are physical gaps. And one we have sequencing gaps. This sequencing gaps is those which we know the orientation based on the insert sequence, but that region has not been sequenced. I know that this is after this, but I do not have an information between. I just have the insert sequence information, but I do not have any sequence in it. So in that case also ends will be there. Yeah, in those cases we will have ends. And in these cases, what will happen? It will break into two scaffolds. I do not know scaffold one is after scaffold two or not, but yeah, there is some thing. So the scaffold will be breaking there. We do not have an information in between what is there. But if we have information between, I will have ends in it and it will form a scaffold. So this is two types of ends. Uh, no, I am insert sequence. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. So what? Yeah, within the scaffold. Yeah. Between two scaffolds, we cannot, but we also have a super scaffold. So what we do is, uh, if for example, if I'm using one software to do a scaffolding, it might not have got an overlap between those two scaffolds, right? But if I use some other, like I'm using Debrugen and go for an overlap one, yeah. So there are several, uh, there are several uh, software, several ways how we can connect it. So if I use any other approach, I <coughs> might get an overlap between the first scaffold and the second scaffold. Then I can combine it. Yes. So if you're doing for job, yeah. that I mean depends again. Uh, if you're using one software, yeah and you have optimized it, you can use. Now there are softwares which uses both the both algorithms. Both the algorithms, well, yeah. Like Masurka, uses both the algorithms. So mm. you eliminate all your errors of assembly at least. Yeah, okay. Then you go for a gap filling with different, different softwares. Mm -hmm. So they will again fill up. Then you have different, different libraries like mm. MatePair, PackBio and yeah. all. So those can fill up these scaffold ends, ends. in between. Okay. Yeah. You mm -hmm. can use longer reads and insert sequence information, which is still so up here. So it's all a jugglery of uh, the best uh, softwares and most productive softwares, yes. as well as the jugglery of the different uh, platforms. Right. Isn't right. it? Right. Exactly. Single yeah. one may not give you the Single complete picture not, of it. But if smaller genomes like yeah, bacteria smaller genomes all, like bacteria can, and all, yes, you definitely. can go with one uh, with platform one because platform. the complexity yeah. is also less. That's right. But if you are going for fungus yeah. and all those eukaryotic things. genomes, you need to have different exactly. platforms, different softwares to bring out the assembly. Bring out the assembly. Or else you need to optimize it. That's right. So we have optimized on so many years. So now we know okay, if the sequence looks like this, the <coughs> genome looks like this. So this software will work well for this. Right. So we need to identify what is exactly coming out. Hmm. At the first preliminary assembly, what we have? We have the more number of ends or we have more number of contexts. Hmm. What is the issue? So yeah. that has to be identified. Based on that, we can use whichever software we want. Yeah. Um, let me understand, uh, help me to understand that after making scaffolds, the regions which uh, you are putting in uh, to join the two scaffolds, so you are saying that reason may not have been uh, sequenced, so we do not have overlapping of that. Because of that, uh, 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 I mean, uh, this uh, consensus sequences are not formed for that region. So you are saying uh, we are joining it based on our uh, insert sequences. So insert information, yeah. Insert information. So from where we are getting that information and. Uh, what in the sequencing, sequence? we have an R1 and an R2. Okay. In the library, mm -hmm. I'm creating 1KB library of MatePair, mm -hmm. right? In MatePair 1KB, I'm just having a base of 150 and 150. 150. Rest is all my information that something is there mm -hmm. in between. Yes. There is a yes. distance in between these two reads. Yes. So assembler tries and assemble in that distance, right? So what we give, we tell the software that this is a library with 1KB plus minus 200 basis, right? So it becomes 800 to 1200. So that is what is the distance the assembler will consider. And in that distance only read one and read two will have an overlap. If it doesn't get a read <coughs> one and read two overlap, it will not assemble. So that's where I know ki something is there in between and will fill it with ends if I'm not getting any overlaps in that gap, yeah? Yeah. So this is how contexts are created and based on that scaffolds and scaffolds have ends in between and this ends are filled using gaps. This is an overall uh, picture of how assembly looks like. We have a genome, we have uh, small sequences of reads which are having uh, the overlaps you can see and has a distance equivalent distance you will be able to see. So they are having equivalent distance because the assembler is been instructed to find overlaps between that particular distance itself. Mm, there only it can become a accurate assembling or else it will be a random one and uh, you will uh, end up having some, some sequence which is jumbled up, right. Then we have context, 
and followed by scaffolds. Scaffolds, you can see paired and reeds. This distance is called your insert. So, this is how the paired and reeds maps the insert sequence is there, and we can end up having a draft genome. Close the gaps and have a draft genome. This was a summary of a genome assembly. Between the scaffolds, right? With that, uh, and the platform like Pagbio and all whatever you will use. Yes. Since before you told that ten percent may be the error in that platform. Yeah. But so we will be if we are using a hybrid uh, approach, mm. we will eliminate those errors using short read technology. Again, no. Beforehand only we are eliminating. We will do the filtration mm. beforehand of only Pagbio data, mm. eliminate those errors and then use. If I am only doing pack bio sequencing, then I do not have anything to eliminate. Mm -hmm. I will eliminate based on quality and all those things and then use it. So, I cannot differentiate whether the indels is for that particular platform or whether it was there in the sample. Mm -hmm. right? So, that is why hybrid approaches are good if you are going for complex organisms. Right? So, short reads can be used to eliminate those errors of indels. So, that I will filter out in the beginning itself and then use those reads in my the <coughs> error correction is uh, through software only. It's not manual. Yes. Correct. Nothing Typically, is software. you use Illumina reads, yeah. having Illumina very high reads. accuracy rate. Right. With this uh, pack bio rate, which is having random there error. There are quantum and there are different softwares which can be used yeah. to <coughs> eliminate these errors. So uh, you that means you will be correcting the pack bio reads. Right. We do an error correction error in the pack bio. That correction is done through software only. Software only. Okay. Using your short read technology. For the students, uh, that is a point actually. Uh, it's nice that she opened up the topic. You have uh, random <coughs> error in uh, back by your long read, long reads because one of the speaker highlighted it here. And the Illumina has got maybe in the systematic error they say, uh, but we combine these two, then uh, the random error and the systematic error will be corrected by either reads. Am I right? Yeah. What is the difference between this systemic er systematic error and random errors? See, random are these long reads. What happens is that they, uh, they the sequencing chemistry is very different. If you see sequencing chemistry, it is based on polymerase, right? What happens when you are sequencing the repeats? When the repeat comes, the polymerase slips over and cannot sequence that part. So the read is breaking at that end, and it may skip that region or may sequence something else introducing something there right so the repetitive regions or for example we recently did a uh, very complex fish so in that we were having somewhere around 85 percent of repeats the output of that particular smrt is 5 gb but we could only get 1 gb per smrt because the polymer was just clipping off and slipping down whether that's a theoretical explanation but when we have the reads, the reads were not going beyond 2 kb, right? whereas it should reach up to 15 kb. So, my average read length was coming 1 kb or 2 kb max. So, that means I am having something which is just clipping off the polymerase and the reads are getting chopped off. So, there can be a chances that it is introducing something else. So, it if it is introducing SNPs, indels, Usually, what we see in PacBio, they introduce indels, right? So, to correct these indels and all, we can use these platforms and correct those indels. Illumina, the technology is different, right? Huh, short short reads, so it is having an adapter and the adapter is getting sequenced. So, there is a DNA template which is getting sequenced. It is not a polymerase which binds, one one base is not getting sequenced. Right, so the technology, the sequencing chemistry itself is very different. <coughs> it's sequence by sequence chemistry in Illumina. Right, so there is shorter library. Sequencing is based on DNA templates. It's a bridge amplification. You can just go through bridge amplification. You'll understand what is the difference between both. Yeah. So basically, once you sequence it, it's So, once we have an assembly, 
what we usually see is the total number of scaffolds or contacts, how much we have assembled. The lesser the number, the better it is. That means it is more closer to the chromosomal level. Right. Then we see the genome assembly, which is your with gaps and without gaps. With gaps is the actual size of the genome. For example, if I am assembling 50 MB, my actual size should be between 45 to 55. Right, so that is a close by. It is not necessary. Always you will end up with that particular uh, number. But usually for a good assembly, we try and be close to the genome size. Uh, but we will have a homologous genome already known or else we can find out the genome size from any of the existing ones or else we can also identify using in silico bases based on KMOS. So, there are softwares available to identify in silico genome size which might not be accurate but yes we can identify and we can see. So, if we do not get any clue we do identify and be close to that particular size. Yeah, so, we can use the paired end reads to identify in silico what is the size approximate. So, once we are approaching that size with gaps, we see without gaps how much. So, from here we can see how better is my SMB. If I have, if I am ending up having 50 MB and only uh, 4 MB is my basis and rest is all ends, that means a huge difference. So, that cannot be an SMB, that cannot be a draft SMB, it should be the opposite way. It should be somewhere around 45 MB and 5 MB I am having gaps or 10 MB I am having gaps. That is a comfortable genome assembly to be published. Right. So, this is what we, we see. Then the average scaffold size, the greater it is, you will have maximum scaffolds like 21 KB or more, the more it is better, the assembly will be better. We also reach to 1, 2, 3 MB as well. So, that is very good assembly wherein you have a maximum size of 3 MB in de novo. <coughs> then we have N50, N50 is nothing but a cumulative value that, that means 50 percent of your uh, context will be above this size. So, based on these size we can say whether the assembly is good or not. You can see here 241 KB is the size that means a comfortable assembly to be published a maximum scaffold size and minimum scaffold size and the percentages of ATGC and N. These are the parameters which has been checked to say whether the genome assembly is proper or not. So, we check all these criteria, and in any publication if you see for a genome assembly you will find these criteria written in the paper because these are very important criteria to be seen. These are some of the tools which are being used for uh, genome assembly. Uh, one is SOAP de novo, Masurka, S-PACE. Masurka is again overlapping and debugging both. These uh, different softwares are based on different platforms. All softwares do not use all the platforms. So, based on which platform what has been used that can be checked and these softwares are also for specific region. For example, I am doing scaffolds and context. If it is only Illumina platform, I can use SOAP de novo. But if I am doing a pack bio plus Illumina, I can go for Masurka. <coughs> there is edge space, there are n number of softwares, but this is a small list which we have listed out here. For example, once I have done my scaffolding and everything, I want to still do a super scaffolding, then with pack bio data, I can use PB jelly, which does a scaffolding for only pack bio data. So, if I have lots of ends and I am not able to resolve it with Illumina itself or pack bio with some tool, I can jump over another tool and try it out with this because each tool have its own chemistry, own algorithms how they run, right. So, <coughs> we can do iteratively and then finally, we do a gap close closing using gap closure and then if you want to validate the, our genome assembly, we map up the reads on the genome. For example, paired end reads, I will have more number of paired end reads because usually the genome backbone has been generated using a paired end reads. So, if I have generated the backbone with paired end reads, I map that paired end reads on the genome and if my maximum number of reads are mapping to the genome, then what happens is that we say that genome is being assembled in proper manner. 
For example, I'm just able to map my 10% of the reads back. Rest of the reads are not mapping. That means the overlapping or whatever we have done is everything is wrong. My genome is not getting mapped. The read which we have generated, that should be at least 90 to 95% mapping back to the genome. Right? After we have a genome, we do a genome annotation. Genome annotation has uh, several steps. We can do n number of things. That's the basic like we have a genome first. Once we have done a genome, we do a gene prediction using any in silico tool. And uh, one of them are Augustus. We can identify the genes. For bacteria, there are like Proca. Uh, you can. Th they also have an online version wherein you can. For bacteria, you can upload the genome and sit because there are small genomes. You have online versions as well for those tools. But the tools which I am talking about, Augustus and all, they are all terminal-based ones. So you can identify the genome. So what it does is that they have a trained model already. For example, we are working on particular genome. So for that similar genome, a trained model will be there of that family or of that genome. For, for example, if you are working on Fusarium, then Fusarium already some strain will be there in that model. If not, we have to find a close related one in the listed genomes which has already been trained for Augustus model. Once we have that, then based on that, we identify the ORFs, CDS or ORFs, and those will be annotated based on NR database. NCBI database, we annotate and we identify those ORFs or CDS which we have identified, which gene are those. So based on homologous search, we identified using NCBI database. So this is where we have the gene annotation. Apart from gene annotation, we can also do geo classification <coughs> wherein we can functionally classify molecular, cellular and biological processes. So the gene can be classified into these geo classifications. We can also identify different pathways where the genes get enriched, which are the different pathways available. We can do a comparative analysis, compare two genomes together and identify the differences between the genomes, sequence-wise differences. We can identify the SNPs. We can do repeat identification. We can identify which type of repeats are there in the genome, what are the different classifications of the repeats and which classes of repeats are there and how much percentage of repeats are there. Then we also have several databases for pathogen host interaction like Phibase. There are other databases also. I have, I have few clips of it. So those databases can be used to identify whether my genes, which are those genes which are having these interactive uh, genes. So I can also identify that based on BLAST search on these databases. right? So these analysis can be done once we have the entire genome available with us. So that was when we are doing a higher complex genome. This is when we are doing a smaller bacterial genomes. So we have keg pathway, we have comparative analysis, we have phylogenetic analysis, <coughs> post pathogen study, we have orthologous genes, we can identify the orthologous and paralogous genes and we can classify them into geo classifications. So in annotations, we can segregate them in structural and functional annotation and we can identify the genes, we can identify the exons, introns, all these things. So once the functional annotation is there, we can see the species distribution because it is not necessary in NCBI, it will go and hit only your species. For example, if I am doing de novo, I am doing a homologous search. So I will have genes which are getting categorized in several genomes. So I can f identify which is the major genomes it is getting segregated in. The most top one should be your nearest one. Then it is said to be that the annotation and the genome assembly is comparable and similar. Right, so from here, the top species uh, graph, we can identify that this is what is my blast hit. And this is a genome which it is matching maximum. So my genes which are identified matches with this particular genome maximum. So these kind of plots can be made and 
we can identify whether the genome assembly is proper or not. This is the geo classification which classifies your various genes in different classifications, cellular, molecular and biological processes, right and how much percentage of genes are getting segregated in these three classifications. Then we have uh, five base, this is a pathogen host interactive database which consists of somewhere around 6000 genes and this gives you information of pathogenicity, virulence and effector <coughs> genes. So, this is a database for these genes and when you blast against these databases you can get those information. So, you can identify which of your genes falls in which category whether they are virulence or whether they are pathogenic genes. So, the result after blast looks like this. So, I know this particular genome is of this class and my scaffold goes to this right. So, this is gene number 1, gene number 2, gene number 3, gene number 4 so on and this is what is my sequence description, this is what was gene counts. So, I can identify whether which classification falls in. So, this is how you can identify the host pathogen interactive genes. Then we have carbohydrate active enzyme, CAS it is being called. So, in this we have information about the carbohydrate active enzyme sequences. This is also again a database we can blast again this database and identify those information right. In this again we have bacteria, viruses, archaea and eukaryotes the numbers every year it has been updated. So, the numbers goes on changing. <coughs> Keg database where you have various pathways you just have to blast again those Keg databases whatever genes we have identified we just go and blast them identify which are the pathways these genes fall in and these are the rough categories of the pathways which are available. So, we have a metabolism category, we have a genetic information processes, environmental information processes, cellular processes and so on organism, organism systems so on. So, in these categories again we have various pathways carbohydrate in carbohydrate we have glycolysis and all this. So, each and every gene which falls in which pathway that information can be found including those basic <coughs> pathways like glycolysis, Krebs cycle and all. So, all those genes which falls we can identify using Keg database and the pathways look like this. So, wherever you have mapping you can see in different colors where you do not have you might be seeing in white colors you can play around with these databases. Then we have orthologous <laughs> search as I said we can also identify orthologous uh, uh, genes how do we do it? We take the protein sequences of the ones you want to compare along with your protein sequences and we do a ortho MCL that is a tool which can be used for orthologous genes and we identify which are the core genes. Core genes is nothing but this forms a cluster together might be having similar genes together right. So, in these 6 species we have 10740 genes which are common these are called as core genes and we also have some unique species specific genes which are lying here and we will also have some common genes between two of the sets, three of the sets and so on. So, based on your study, based on your interpretation you can identify and you will also come to know the clusters. For example, these many sequences we put, these many clusters it is formed and these are the sequences which are singletons means has not got any clustering, does not cluster with anything. So, that means it might be falling off the criteria. Based on this graph we can identify the unique species specific genes, we can identify the core genes and based on this we can also generate a phylogenetic tree of various species. These are the outcomes of an assembly, in silico genome assembly and then you can also validate your assembly using RNA-seq data because RNA-seq is said to be the coding region of the genome right also has your UTR region. So, mRNA we can sequence and we can map it on <coughs> our genome we should have somewhere around 95 percent of mapping 
of the RNA seq data that means you are covering your 95 percent of your coding region in your genome that means the genome is validated enough to go for. So, that also can be done and then we have different geo terms you know geo classification this is what is the outcome. I will just take 5 more minutes right. Now, the next is your reference seek which is there we will just uh, see how reference seek is done. We have already a genome sequence available. Once we have the genome sequence available, we just map the reads together. These are different reads with different sizes. In this, we do not require a hybrid assembly nor we require a different libraries because we already have an existing genome, right? And we map the reads. Once we map the reads, this is mainly done for studying differences or SNP. Main objective of doing is if we want to find out SNPs, biomarkers, then we go for reference seek. So, in this if I find a region where my reference sequence has a base and this particular read has some other base, you can see a purple line tells me that there is a different base there. The reference and this purple line has a different base. So, I will call it as SNP, right. You can also see here uh, the base which you are able to see those are different than the reference. If I find such cases, <coughs> I will say that there is an SNP. For example, uh, the reference has T and the sequence base has A, that means the difference is T to A. So, there is an SNP which is T to A. Yeah. When you do uh, resequence, uh, reports are considered meters as compared yes. to DNOVA yes. SNP. Yes. Right. So, when you do this uh, uh, resequencing, which sequencing platform is ideally suitable? Uh, it depends again, uh, you can also use the uh, short read technology for bacteria and all short read is good enough. You can also go for pack bio which will uh, straight away give you a one uh, long sequence and the entire bacteria gets sequenced off. For viruses also similar case if you use pack bio a straight sequence will come and you have a reference to map it and do it. So, you can also go for pack bio and short read, but it also depends upon the budget because long uh, sequencing reads are not. Uh, not cheap enough, they are costly. The short read technology because it is a reference <coughs> base, you can map it easily. So, this so is one of the important points. Most of the time, in the future, we will end up in re sequencing only <laughs> because all the genomes are already sequenced. So, you have to be very careful uh, and they have to be, in the sense, as Peter uh, rightly put it, the genome size will decide whether to go for short read sequencing technology or long read sequencing technology. Right? This is something. <coughs> so, we identify SNPs based on the differences in the sequences. So, once we map the reads, right, so what we identify is that from this end to this end of my reference, how much percentage I am covering, that is my genome coverage. In that, we were seeing how much is my genome assembly, how much is the percentage of genome content in it, ATGC, that is what is my size of the genome. In this, we will see if my size of genome is 50 <coughs> MB, right, how much I am going to cover. After mapping, how many ends or whatever it is, how much I am able to cover across. So, that is where comes your genome coverage. So, we can if we have uh, chromosomal wise, we can chromosomal wise identify what is my genome coverage. If I only have one chromosome, I can identify how much is my genome coverage based on calculating the ATGC against the ends. The more number of ends, the lesser the percentage of coverage it is. That means that region I could not cover with the resequencing. Then we identify SNPs. So, this can be your scaffolds or this can be your chromosomes. We identify G to A at these locations. So, we get a file wherein it is called as VCF file which is a raw file of SNP, wherein I can identify which base is getting changed to which base on which location. And if I want to visualize, I can visualize as I we saw <coughs> in the first slide using IGV, we can visualize individual base by base whether exactly the tool has called the SNP or not. And these SNPs will also have a quality score, 
with the confidence it has been called. For example, if I have 10 reads mapping at that region and only two reads says that it is T and rest of the reads say it's reference reads. For mm -hmm. example, in this if I have G to A and only two reads say it's A and rest of the eight reads say it's G, still it will call an SNP, but that will, will not be a true SNP. That needs to be figured out based on the read numbers which are mapping to the particular location. right? So, these are the information which we get in the file and based on that we filter out the unwanted SNPs or false calls. right? We filter out those and only keep those which have high confidence. So, what is the threshold limit when you say that I, I take only this number as a uh, SNP? SNP? Yeah. So, you yeah. so, again uh, usually we take 5x, 3x. So, 3x means 3 reads should be there to call it an SNP. If we have ending up with lots of SNPs, we go with 10, 15x of coverage. So, 15, 10 sequences should be there for that particular SNP to call a SNP is there. Like in human cases, we take 3, 5, 8x. 8 is the minimum, optimum wherein we can call an SNP. For plant cases, we will end up lots of SNPs. We go with 15, 20 X and we identify. And with hetero and homo, what we do is that uh, 60, 40 ratio. So, if there is 60 percent allelic call and 40 percent your reference call, I can call it as a hetero call. That both the bases are there, one allele is this, one allele is this. So, SNP calling is based on consensus? Based on consensus. So, it is usually uh, picked from the BAM file. Consensus is also picked up from the BAM file. We got this point. Late evening, you know, it's difficult to grasp things. Yeah. Downside. Looks like it. Yeah. This point is very important. SNP calling is the hot subject nowadays. Consensus of accuracy region. Yeah, so, the SNPs which are there will be evident enough in your consensus sequence. That what is the sequence of your genome. Yeah. And then we can annotate the SNPs based on the GFF file which will be available for the genome. So, if we are using a reference based one, we already have the annotation, we already have everything we have. What we have to just do? We have to compare the sequenced genome of ours with that particular annotation, that particular genome. And we can fetch out all the information whatever was there existing. <coughs> so, this is an easier job than doing a de novo one. Thank you. So, Any questions? I think that was a, a nice you know, back to back lecture. I'm sure uh, the previous speaker made a lot of information. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Clarifications, you are most welcome to clarify your doubts. Kavi has got some questions. Ma'am, where most of our fungal genomes may have heterocytosity, uh, what approach should be using for assembly of heterocytous genomes? Where will be ending up in the buffers? And will there be any alteration in the deviation there? Uh, no, see we will use a hybrid approach, whether it is a heterozygous genome or that will not matter much. The complexity of the genome will matter, right. So, in hybrid approach when we are assembling, those things will uh, get eliminated. Second thing, debrugian graph only cuts the genome in smaller region, nothing else it does and it forms a graph. Like in an assembly, if you are assembling a heterozygous genome, then we may end up in getting a bubble, where there will be a two part. So, but which one will be? Yeah, so when we are doing a chemo size, if I cut the chemos in smaller regions, 
and if I have only just imagine 21 basis sequences and I find an overlap, there will be no bubbles, it will find an overlap. There are very small sequences, 21 bases just imagine and 21 bases into some millions. If I have 10 million reads, 21 bases into 10 million. Just imagine how many sequences are there, one after the other, each sequence is getting aligned with each other. So that point will not be validated. Like from a single cell, there are two DNA molecules, yeah. two have different sequences. So there will be getting 50,000 at this position. <coughs> By the overlapping when I am doing with a small sequence, I will get a approximate overlap, right? Yeah. Whether the both the DNA templates, when I sequence also, when I am isolating the DNA and sequencing, I have both the DNA templates with me, right? You are saying both the cases will be there, right? One and two. Both in the sequence. Exactly, but when I am having an overlap, will go on overlapping, right? Because I am cutting down shorter sequences, it becomes very short. 21 basis, 15 basis is very short for me to go on overlapping those sequences. And well, when you have long reads, what is the necessity for going for thinner based approach where you are still in increasing the complexity in the case of repetitive reads? So, when we are taking longer Long reads, we do not go for smaller chemos. We go with longer chemos, right. So, we will not go with uh, 10, 15 bases. So, it depends upon what is your read length as well for deciding the chemos. For uh, 150 bases, I cannot go with a chemo of uh, 121, something like that, right. Then it becomes complex. Yes, if a genome is simpler, I can go with higher number of uh, length chemos. But if I am going with PacBio and I cut it in uh, 10 bases, will not make sense for me, right. So, we will not go with smaller chemos, we will go with longer chemos. Then, one more practical question. Other than the termin terminal based uh, assembly, is there any Windows based? Uh, terminal based ones? Windows based, okay. <coughs> Ah. So, you have uh, CLC and all which are Windows based, you want to say GUI based, mm -hmm. GUI based where you can click click and do it, but still you need to understand what is the chemistry behind it because you will have ending up with lots of uh, options. But we do have GUI based, no, no. <laughs> their reads will only not open, <laughs> so rest of the assembly you can not think of. And like at least for your simple uh, like quality checking and trimming. Other than these fast QC at the moment, is there any GUI based? GUI based filtration tools, uh, we do have. Uh, fast QC uh, kit is there, which is a GUI based, what I remember. There are GUI based tools, but then again, for that also, you will have to have a 16 GB or 32 GB RAM PC or computer to execute it. A bacteria can be executed on 16 GB. Fungal, I am not pretty sure how much data you are going to generate and you will be able to do it on 16 or not. Yes. Any more questions? So, I was just, uh, since the questions were coming up, I was just thinking that uh, the lecture part is one thing, but probably still for you to visualize everything is still difficult. Like, I am not too sure how much visualization you can do when she says cuts, reads, coming together, overlapping and all. So, I think we, we should make an attempt somewhere to show the whole process to them. I don't know. If we can manage, we should. But the, in the process, uh, apart from white and black screen, they will not be able to see anything. <laughs> what I spoke, they will not be able to visualize that. Yeah. On for the that, screen. I'm telling you, uh, you have a number of uh, YouTube videos of You have to take out time and uh, spend uh, a couple of hours, if not on a daily basis, at least daily. weekly basis. That one, you have to top up this training offer your platform uh, to acquire some knowledge yeah. and how far you will be uh, skillful, we don't know. At least the knowledge part uh, is done. This is a deliberate, we are posing it as a challenge. Right. 
we are for, we are forcing you to sit here up to 6:30 uh, in the day. Uh, that means what? It's a training, a deliberate training. So only thing is you need to top it up. And if you forget after 31st of December, then you'll go back <laughs> to the original settings. <laughs> Right. The, 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 so terms, the terminology is being used, if that you are able to understand and if you go back and practice on it, probably slowly you will catch up. That's yeah. what I think. You have to practice the time and again. Yeah. Practice it, that will be <coughs> perfect, it will be subject. Uh, ultimately, it is your interest. Like no more no. mathematics tool can be taught in a classroom. It's Maybe very over five minutes. Right. People can give you some orientation. Maybe they will introduce the topic. Ultimately, you have to practice it. Right. Unless and until you practice it through the data, mm -hmm. the data, or you generate mm -hmm. all the data. Or maybe uh, you take some data from the database, then practice. Then okay. there's a lot of opportunities. Right. So, uh, you need to practice it. Uh, that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, there is a question from you. You have NCBI database where n number of data is there. The raw data yeah. people yeah. submit. You can go and download and play around, especially for bacteria, you can play around because they are smaller data and assemble them. And every tool, whichever is available, everything has uh, its own tutorial, which uh, manuals, which you can read and do it. And there are also GUIs which are freely available. Some have some tra training periods like uh, trial periods, like your uh, CLC has a 14 days trial period. You can try out those things and play around with it. So, uh, asking, uh, to so earlier you were doing uh, uh, very resistant, very resistant, very The practical approach of that's where the interaction of the uh, host and the pathogen or host of the bacteria will come. It's not if you do it individually, if pathogens separate and hosts separate, putting them together will not be it will be a little difficult. But if you do this kind of a study where the interaction is taking place, then only you will probably be able to come out with some kind of a strategy. That's my opinion. Yeah. Anybody so you can, can also do a RNA seq wherein you can identify what are the genes falling in what, like which are the genes getting expressed in that particular host pathogen interactions. Yeah. And identify. You are getting to the QTLs, right? So the QTL mapping is also possible using genomes, right? You can identify the genome, go down and make a physical map when you are doing a de novo and map your QTLs on the genome, right? So you identify where exactly your genome, your QTLs are mapping. And then you can put it in your practical way. I do not know the practical aspect of it. But yes, you can identify. So these QTLs, these trade markers, these SNPs, all this can help you using these technology. And if you want to work more closely with the host pathogen interaction, you can do RNA-C, identify the gene expressions and which are the genes actually playing part in that particular <coughs> when that it is During infected. Exactly. Anybody else can uh, supplement these details? No, no, he wants an answer for his question. I don't know he's convinced. Kavit? Yes. He's having some answer. So, some, uh, in biogenetics, I uh, did that. Yeah, so, there was a genome association. Yes. 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 Really good. So we don't have to use QTL terms here. So maybe to land on gene-specific markers, this may help me. And if we get gene-specific markers, then it is more useful. What is more important is, she already put it, we need, need to integrate data sets. Yeah. 
Genome data alone may not be sufficient. You have to go for transfer. So you'll understand uh, which plant gene is upregulated or downregulated when the pathogen is uh, making your yeah, presence. So uh, that can be the starting point, you know, to to that open up a lot of opportunities. Okay. So certainly uh, the genomic science has got its own, uh, you know, uh, uh, contributions to shorten your efforts to meet the desired uh, end result. Mm -hmm. That is, we will deliberate that in the coming days also. Any, anybody else? There was a question from this side. In case of SNPs, you told that a cut off minimum side like 8x, you told, no? somewhere 8x to 10x. But we are going for a coverage of 50x or even 100x, you told. Then why the cut off for the SNP is less? It should be at least more than 60, 70 yeah, percent. That depends upon which genome you are working on. For example, if you are working on bacteria, Bacterial genomes will be having lots of variations, but all the variations you will not call it as SNPs, mm -hmm. right? But so in you case might of plants? In case of plants, as I said, in plants, uh, as you have complexities also, so sequencing errors will also be there. So we take a higher depth coverage, 20, 30x, mm -hmm. and that should be sufficient for calling an SNP. That's a cutoff, 20x, but I don't mean that the, all the SNP will be of 20x. Everything will be somewhere around. Uh, somewhere around 50, 60, 70 x okay. in the SNPs will be written. But that is a cutoff. I will, will not call an SNP anything below 20 x. Because there will be some random errors will be there. That exactly. Should not call SNP. Yeah. So, those will be eliminated with the tool itself. The confidence level based on the read <coughs> quality of that particular base, everything will be taken care. The mapping quality at which confidence level it is mapping to the reference. For example, in the read, only uh, five bases are mapping, rest of the bases are just not mapping, has a mismatch. That read will not be considered in my SNP. Right? I think lot of practice, and then only your own confidence will also come in. <laughs> Anybody else have some questions? Okay, if uh, yeah. no more questions, I will uh, uh, summarize. to propose a formal vote of thanks. Okay, we first uh, give a small token of uh, affection to Arpita. Everything there? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Uh, oh, okay. We have to give, uh, because we don't need to document. We have to document <laughs> this. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.